Warm greetings to everyone who joined us today for our exclusive webinar on the Indian fixed income market. I am Maxim Zenkov, head of India fixed income at C-Bonds, global financial data provider with a special focus on bonds. And I will be your moderator for today. The poster of our event and our announcement in social media featured two time zones, Delhi and London. It is instructive as we can rightfully say that Indian debt market now lives in many time zones simultaneously. On the one hand, the rapidly growing market remains hugely inward oriented. But on the other hand, it attracts rapidly growing attention of the foreign investors. And the recently closed financial year 2023 became landmark in this sense. The ambiguity is elsewhere. Even as India is becoming an increasingly desirable destination for global fixed income investors, elaborate restrictions on capital account transactions are still in place. So are secondary market liquidity concerns, issues of credit rating credibility, and many more. All in all, inclusion in global emerging market bond indices raises no less questions than it answers. Investing in Indian market from the overseas, even if you are a non-resident Indian, requires nuanced understanding of macro legal intricacies, as well as refined investment ideas. Luckily, today we have a wonderful team of panelists to walk us through the road of complexities and opportunities. Let me introduce them. The first is Vivek Kumar, economist at Quant Eco Research and, of course, macroeconomic rock star, as he is referred to. Quant Eco Research provides research on uh, India covering real economy, policy environment, rates, and currency market. Hi, Vivek. Hi, Max. Good to be with you on the webinar. Uh, let me introduce uh, Vedgata Krishnan Srinivasan founder and managing partner at Rockford FinCap, a boutique financing solutions company. Venkat Krishnan is a bond market veteran with over 30 years of experience and, of course, an enthusiast readily sharing his expertise on the pages of various media. Hi, Venkat. Hi, Maxim. Hi, everyone. And last but not least, Nihaz Bashir, senior partner at Vadia Gandhi & Co., one of the oldest law consultancy firms in India. Nihas himself has over 15 years of experience in banking and finance legal practice. Hi, Nihas. Good evening, uh, Maxim, and thank you for having me on. And uh, before we start, let me briefly outline our structure for today. Firstly, the speakers will do presentations on the issues of their special expertise. Then I will tell a bit about what CBONS database can offer to those contemplating investing in India. Then we will switch to questions by the moderator and then by our dear audience. Don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat box and I'm sure the speakers uh, will do their best to address all your questions. Uh, I guess everything is clear now and uh, with uh, no further delay, let me pass the floor to Vivek Kumar, who will explore the macroeconomic fundamentals underlying the bond market. So, hi everyone, and uh, thanks to C Bonds that we are hosting this webinar for the first time, especially dedicated to Indian uh, fixed income market. We, as Maxim said, uh, we are at the cusp of a seminal change, and uh, this macroeconomic change will have reper repercussions both on the economy as well as on the financial markets uh, for India. We are, the event that we are talking about is the listing of in India in the global bond indices, to be precise, the emerging market bond in indices to start off with. But before we take that plunge, we know that the events are scheduled starting June. It will uh, kickstart with the JP Morgan bond index, and then it will be followed again um, by the Bloom one of the Bloomberg indices later in the month of January of 2025. Before that event kick starts, it, it's always good to have a bird's eye view of what's in store from the economic standpoint. And um, this is this is my role here to give a, give you a snapshot of how things stand uh, as it is today. So if we can uh, move forward, uh, Max. So India as an economy, 
uh, offers a great opportunity both in terms of size as well as in terms of speed. Now, what I mean by these two S's, size and speed, is the fact that uh, there is enough economic might. Now, India, as of 2023, is estimated to be the fifth largest economy in the world by the IMF. Heading into 2026, India would probably replace uh, Japan and become the fourth largest, uh, Germany and become the fourth largest economy in the world. By year 2027, India is expected to become the third largest economy in the world. These are not our projections. These are projections made by the, the IMF. So by 2027, we are talking about the third largest economy, US, China, and India. They would hold the key in terms of the overall global pie. Now, it's not just the size. I think the speed also here matters. So if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, India is expected to command a growth premium of roughly 3.2 percentage points over the rest of the world. So by rest of the world means we take the average growth rate of world GDP and compare it with India. The projections for IMF suggest that there will be a growth spread of nearly 3.2 percentage points. Now, this is as far as the rest of the world is concerned. If you focus on the emerging markets where India is an important part of, the growth spread is at 2.3%. So the spread or the premium, as we would like to call, is seen both in case of emerging markets as well as the entire global uh, economy. So if we can move forward, uh, Maxim. Now, there is one question that we keep on uh, getting uh, from our clients is that how has the post-COVID recovery been? We, we've heard of uh, very high numbers in the very recent past, 7%, 8%, 9% growth rates for India in the last two or three years. Now, it's always good to see how the recovery looks like vis-a-vis -vis what other countries are doing. Now, if you just do a simple plot of how countries uh, took a hit post-COVID and how has the recovery been thereafter, then uh, India actually stands pretty much along the trend line. So we did take a big knock and, and the recovery also has been more or less in line. So this is a plot of how countries took a hit on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the recovery in 20. So 2020 is your hit vis-a-vis -vis 2019 GDP. 2023 is your recovery vis-a-vis -vis 2019 GDP. So you can see that India pretty much is following the broad trend line as far as most of the other countries uh, are depicting. So it's pretty much in the middle of the pack. Now, having said so, uh, I think the important point here is to understand that, well, yes, 7%, 8%, 9% GDP growth we've seen in the recent past. A lot of these numbers have been buoyed by exceptionally good statistical base. And COVID did induce a lot of statistical uh, uh, dichotomy in our, in our statistical systems. And because of that, we did have a fair run of favorable statistical base, which had been buoying the, uh, the overall growth numbers. Also, the economy was recovering, lockdowns, uh, were phased out. So a lot of pent-up demand was there. So we'll have to treat these numbers uh, in light of these developments. Having said so, is there one characteristic which defines the growth recovery in the post-COVID phase? I think something very important to keep in mind that the recovery has been predominantly led by investments. And when I say investments, it is largely led by public capital. Government, whether it is center or whether it is state, put together, they've been spending uh, a lot uh, in fact, the government, I would say that, has borne the burden of pump priming the economy in the post-COVID phase. So that has clearly uh, held us good. And the private consumption, on the other hand, is just about you know coming out of the, the, the COVID levels in terms of the, the overall uh, volume of consumption. So private consumption, the recovery is not complete, but compared to where investments stand, it's extremely anemic. If we can move forward, now, this is what the picture is as of today. Now, if one has to focus on what's happening currently, what's happening now, then this is where I think there is a reason for optimism because off late, we've been tracking many high frequency indicators. Some of them are ultra, frequent, ultra high frequency indicators. By ultra high frequency indicators, we mean that either the indicators are daily or weekly. And they come out, uh, or maybe the monthly indicators come out within the first uh, month, first few days of the next month. The ultra high frequency indicators tell us that uh, the momentum in the economy is actually showing up well. 
in fact there was an expectation that by fourth quarter of the current financial year of, of the financial year which just got concluded in march 24 things would start to moderate some of the ultra high frequency indicators are not depicting that so at quantico we have created a a, a monthly payments tracker and this payments tracker tells us that uh, the value of payments has actually been the most strongest in uh, jan to march quarter of uh, the previous financial year so it's it's at 20% as you can see on the chart on the left hand side some of the high frequency indicators like pmi manufacturing pmi services petroleum consumption um, vehicle registration gst revenue all of these indicators are either telling us that momentum has either held uh, in comparison to what we saw in the first three quarters of the financial year or it has actually improved so these are early early indicators and the early indicators are extremely encouraging as far as the economy is concerned if we can move forward what holds in store for fi 25 is not just the uh, the strong momentum that we are seeing which is which is likely to continue the central government capex and the state government capex continues at a very healthy pace yes there was a budget which was announced in february it was interim in nature because the new government which will uh, assume office in june of 2024 post elections they'll present a new budget budget will supersede the budget which was presented in february but our guess is that the broader message in terms of uh, the overall thrust on on economy and overall thrust on fiscal policy is not going to change because there is an expectation that the same government uh, this 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 is not my expectation this is what the consensus in the market at this point in time believes that the same government is likely to assume office once again and if that were to be the case the overall policy thrust is unlikely to change so we believe that capex will continue to remain a priority for the government and this is likely to show up in fi 25 24 25 as well the other favorable development which has happened in the last one week has been um, the forecast from some of the weather agencies in the country earlier in the week the, the private weather agency called skymet said that india is likely to receive 100% of uh, the long period average rainfall in the upcoming southwest monsoon season now in case of india the southwest monsoon season runs from june till september that is where the majority or the maximum uh, of uh, the rainfall that happens through the year happens in these four months during the course of the year the uh, the private weather agency said that there will be a 2% excess uh, rainfall this year the official government body which is the imd indian meteorological department it says that the uh, amount of rainfall is likely to be close to 106% which essentially means that rainfall would be 6% over and above what is considered to be normal now this is good news this is good news because um just about two weeks back the imd said that country is likely to experience a significant heat wave during the april to june period so if the heat wave is followed by an above normal monsoon it is likely to be beneficial and it is likely to offset all the risks that you see in the in the um, one or two months uh, from now on if we can move forward now it's it, it holds importance uh, from uh, not just growth side i think monsoon being normal also is extremely important from an inflation perspective and inflation as we see uh, ended at 5.4% in the in the previous financial year uh, the year which ended in march 24 this was the lowest inflation print in the post covid phase the expectation uh, quantico forecast for fy25 is that inflation will be at 4.5% this would be the lowest in the post covid phase once again and this would be getting close closer to the 4% inflation target which the RBI has been constantly reiterating every meeting after meeting the one a good feature that we observed in the inflation data at a micro level is the fact that nearly 55% of the cpi basket is now within the target band this is the largest or the greatest share that we observed in the current cpi series the take away that we have here is that inflation moderation is getting more broad based if we can move forward uh in terms of drivers core inflation is where most of the comfort lies by core inflation we typically what economists do is they, they strip out the volatile components of food and fuel and what is left is called core inflation the core inflation on the producer price side it has been in negative territory for 13 months in a row 
core inflation on the consumer price side has been at three and a half percent, which is at a series low uh, for the current CPI scene. So extremely comforting um, core inflation numbers. What is, however, a concern is the fact that food inflation has been elevated, clocking more than 7%, 8% levels for, uh, for a series of months now. And there are various pressure points in food. One driver continuously gives way to another driver. So there are drivers within the food inflation basket which, which keep moving up and moving down, which is actually leading to an upside pressure on the overall food basket. If we can move forward. Now, fuel is where um, I think the things can get tricky because what is, happen is happening is, is, is that there is a dichotomy between what international prices are suggesting now and, and where domestic prices are uh, headed or in fact at, at the current juncture. Now, domestically, we've seen uh, fuel prices being almost re semi-regulated by the government. And um, ahead of the election, um, uh, the announcement of the election, the government actually did a sizable reduction on LPG cylinders, on petrol, and as well as on diesel. But because of these reductions, we would actually, uh, we actually believe that inflation could be closer to four and a half percent in financial year 2425. Having said so, last two to three weeks of international fuel price movement does not give us that confidence. In fact. Our statistical analysis tells us that if crude were to average at 100, we've taken an average of 85 for our forecast of 4.5% CPI inflation. If crude were to average at 100, CPI inflation would be 50 basis points higher than what we are projecting right now. So this is a risk that uh, the market participants should factor in uh, because geopolitics is something which is completely unpredictable in nature and the way things are escalating between Iran and Israel, uh, it would be... Uh, I guess one pro probably will have to be as nimble as possible as far as some of these positions are concerned. Now, if we can move forward and, and see what it implies from a policy perspective and what are the takeaways for the financial market participants. Now, there is a chorus, there at least was a chorus till, uh, till a month back with respect to monetary policy pivot across the world. In fact, few central banks have already started doing it. Brazil is one important emerging central bank which has done it. Uh, the Swiss central bank, Swiss National Bank has uh, uh, come out and cut interest rates, and that was a surprise move. So few banks have already started doing it. Central banks have already started doing it. The Fed is where uh, the question mark lies because the U.S. economic resilience has pushed markets' expectation of an early pivot. Uh, so earlier it was in March, then it moved to June. Now even the June rate cut has been now priced out. The market participants are now looking at just about two rate cuts from the Federal Reserve. What it does to uh, emerging market central banks like uh, like the RBI is that it will probably push the uh, rate easing cycle uh, by a couple of months more because if the Fed uh, delays the rate easing cycle, there will be uh, standing at this point in time. Anything which is close to one and a half to two percentage points of real interest rate, uh, as far as RBI is concerned, probably is in a sweet spot. And currently, we are getting close to that sweet spot. So there is no urgency from the RBI to deviate from that sweet spot because the, the kind of growth assumptions that we are making, if we can move forward to the next slide, the kind of growth assumptions that we have made, uh, the CPI assumptions that, that we that that or the trajectory which is out there gives us a comfort that RBI is actually should not be in a hurry to ease interest rates. Our in-house monetary conditions index also does not suggest that the monetary conditions are extremely restrictive. So RBI has a lot of headroom to play the patience game. And while our official forecast is for the first rate easing to start in August, this is contingent upon. Uh, an easing signal from the Federal Reserve, as well as a very good normal monsoon outturn. So provide, uh, provided these assumptions play out, the August rate cut should, should, should most likely happen. If there is a delay on account of Fed or if there is some spatial or intertemporal uh, disturbance in terms of the monsoon progress, then you could see a delay in RBI's rate easing cycle as well. Having said so, the expectation that we have is that this rate cut cycle, I would probably not even call it a cycle because typically when you say a rate cut cycle or a rate hike cycle, it should be at least one percentage points. So we are not calling for a one percentage point rate cut. We are calling for a just about 75 basis point rate cut. 
So it would be more like a fine tuning of the policy rate rather than getting into a full fledged break eating cycle. Now, if you can move forward from a market perspective, uh, we need to take care of the fiscal side of the equation as well. The FISC has actually been surprising pleasantly. The markets were uh, pen penciling in a 5.2%, 5.4% fiscal deficit for the current financial year, the new financial year, whereas the government has set an aggressive fiscal target of 5.2% vis-a-vis what the, where the market participants were. So a, a consolidation in FISC is something which is desirable. It is also desirable from a bond market perspective because it reduces the supply pressure to that extent, which we see uh, playing out in the current financial year, the gross borrowing requirement of both the central government and the public sector entities, the PSUs or the PSEs that we call here, is uh, slated to come down to four and a half percentage points of GDP in the, in the new financial year, vis-a-vis 5.4 in the, in the previous financial year. So as and when fiscal consolidation progresses, the supply pressure will ease. And it's not just the headline consolidation in fiscal. I think what is also happening behind the headline numbers is that there is a, an extremely good amount of fiscal quality adjustment. As I had mentioned earlier, it is this fiscal consolidation is being led by uh, almost two decade high uh, CAPEX GDP ratio. So not just the headline is improving, it's also a quality of adjustment which matters, which is good for growth, which is good for inflation because it improves your supply side. And uh, fundamentally from a bond market perspective, it reduces your supply burden. If you can move forward now, we are optimistic about uh, the the demand supply picture for for the government bond market in the current financial year because of uh, the bond index inclusion. Our expectation is that about twenty to twenty one billion dollars can be attributed to in, to the JP Morgan uh, index inclusion itself. This is likely to be followed by another three to four billion dollars when India gets included in the Bloomberg index uh, later in January. So uh, net net, if you add them together, we could be looking at a $25 billion of pool uh, of passive money, which would flow into the country uh, between now and maybe January of 2025. But this is extremely good because uh, this obviously takes care of a, of a lot of supply in terms of the ratios that we are calculating. The additional inflow that we get in FI 24-25 will absorb about 15% of the bond supply from the central government. That's a big relief. and. Um, in terms of where this particular fly, uh, supply or where this particular flow is getting concentrated, we note that the the inclination is to towards the five to ten year segment. So we are looking at the data between October and March, uh, October twenty three to March twenty four. That September was the announcement by J P Morgan, and between October and March, we've observed that nearly ninety four percent of the investment has uh, is has gone to just fifteen securities. And out of these 15 securities, 21% is, is accounted by just the 10-year government benchmark security. So between 5 to 10-year segment, this is where most of the excitement lies for foreign investors as far as the data is concerned. And uh, to a large extent, 10-year uh, benchmark security uh, probably uh, is, is the sweetest of all. Now, um, in terms of our outlook, uh, it has gone in recent weeks. But if you can move forward, uh, over the course of next 12 months, we do expect 10-year bond yields to move towards 6.5%, assuming RBI cuts rate by uh, 75 basis points, assuming Fed actually delivers by at least two rate cuts uh, this year, and assuming that inflation moves towards 4.5%. This is, this, is, this is what we are looking at. And to a large extent, it is not just because monetary policy is going to ease. It is also because fiscal policy is comforting, and it is also because the demand supply situation is going to get incrementally better. Now, uh, what are the risks? Clearly, the geopolitical risks and any delay in Fed's pivot will be the key risk to watch for. This is a risk not just for interest rates in India. It is a risk for the exchange rate segment as well. Now, if we can move forward, this is where the last part of the, uh, the outlook is, which is on rupee. Now, the rupee, as we see where things stand, the market is somewhat uh, mildly bullish on rupee if we, we look at most of the polls the market participants are expecting rupee to be at 82 83 one year down the line our in-house expectation is that rupee will probably see a mild depreciation 
and move towards 84 half over the course of next 12 months and the reason why i'm, I'm going to rush through because i have a time limit in mind so i i'm, I'm going to request Maxim to go to the next slide uh, immediately our growth inflation balance uh, matrix actually we have we have a good matrix which is which comes uh, very handy in the uh, in, in trying to get a sense on, on where rupee can be headed. Now, typically, rupee performs the best when growth is very high. So you could say that rupee is actually a growth currency. So whenever growth is more than 7.5%, India's growth is more than 7.5%, rupee tends to appreciate. And rupee does worst when growth is below 6% and when inflation is, is above 6%. So that's the worst combination, macro combination that you can think of. And this is where rupee actually depreciates by almost 11% on an average basis. For FY25, the expectation is that the growth number should be somewhere close to 6.8%, which is like a moderate growth scenario, coupled with a within target expectation on inflation, should ideally lead to a depreciation of 3 to 4% in rupee. Now, as far as interest rates are concerned, you know, this is the growth inflation balance, the, the, the interest rate spread vis-a-vis -vis US. Now, typically, a 2% long-term interest rate spread has generally been associated with a mild weakness in rupee. So both from a growth inflation perspective as well as uh, a real interest rate spread perspective vis-a-vis -vis US, the argument is that rupee could see a mild depreciation uh, pressure. Now, uh, if you can move forward, one of the structural uh, drivers which could actually come in the way of rupee depreciation is the improvement on our current account deficit. Now, post-COVID, this is a key structural improvement which I would highlight here is that the services, India typically has a surplus on its services trade and typically runs a deficit on its uh, merchandise trade. As things stand now, uh, the services trade surplus finances as much as 60% of the, the, the merchandise trade deficit. Now, to give you a context, this number was 35% in 2013 when the taper tantrum episode was happening and rupee took a big knock. So this is a sea change between 20 in the last 10 years in the profile of the current account deficit. And this helps rupee. And that is probably the reason why you would have observed that rupee has been one of the least volatile currencies in the last 12 months. So it's not just the macro fundamentals of growth and inflation. It is also a structural improvement in its current account gap which is uh, helping rupee. Now, as far as flows are concerned, so yes, uh, flows uh, are healthy so far. We expect it to be uh, to, to remain healthy if global interest rates start seeing a downward move. Post elections, there is an expectation that the recent slowdown in FDI that we've, we've observed in the last two, two to three quarters should also start seeing some bit of revival. So what does it all imply for INR? Now, if you can move to the next slide. Uh, well, our observation is that INR is largely a function of what's happening to the dollar in the international FX market, as well as the current account dynamics and the macro fundamentals of growth and inflation. Now, in the post-COVID world, what we observed is that INR's beta towards USD has undergone a change. It has reduced. INR is, you could now argue that INR is now a low, low beta uh, currency vis-a-vis -vis US. This, which essentially what it means is that the same change in dollar is now going to have a lesser impact on INA than what it used to have in the pre-COVID times. So that is something which is good. So INA is a, so what so the things that we've established so far is that INA has become a low beta currency. Uh, there are structural improvements in current account deficit, which is uh, beneficial for rupee. Growth inflation balance is pointing towards a milder depreciation. Last but not the least is the valuation. And uh, INR, as we stand today, is about 6 to 7% overvalued on the real effective exchange rate basis. So that is another metric that tells you that there can be a mild bias for depreciation. Putting it all together, if we can move to the next slide, our view is that on INR, things are going to be extremely comfortable on the downside. And RBI's penchant for uh, accumulating reserves will continue. So we expect INR to move towards 84 and a half by March of 25. This is slightly away from what the consensus are consensus is expecting at this point in time. And last but not the least, the uh, again as I said earlier, geopolitical uncertainty is something which we we'll have to keep on the table on a live basis. So that brings us to the end of my uh, presentation. Over to you, Maxim.
Thank you a lot for your insightful presentation. And what I particularly love about uh, quant eco research work is the comprehensive nature of your approach, because you start from the most generic categories, macro categories, and then you go down to uh, others less expected, maybe uh, such as rainfall or um, others pertaining to the specific context of Indian economy. Uh, thank you a lot, and. Uh, Saying that, I want uh, to pass the floor to uh, Nihaz Bashir, uh, because he will need to leave earlier. Uh, Nihaz vi will guide us uh, through the legal constraints that the foreign investors uh, should be aware of approaching uh, the Indian bond market. Nihaz, please Thank you. Thank help us here. Thank you, Max. The floor is yours. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, firstly, Vivek, thank you for that in-depth analysis of uh, where uh, we are headed from an opportunity perspective. So just, I think, uh, to set the floor on, you know, what the legal regimen looks like. So FPI's uh, foreign portfolio investor is a form of investment regulated to kind of attract uh the class of investors who are looking at a return and not really any kind of a strategic investment or any kind of a control perspective, et cetera, all of that. So we've always had a separate regime for foreign investment by portfolio investors and foreign direct investment, as we call it. So there's an FDI regime in India and there's an FPI regime in India. And uh, the FPI regime is uh, what uh, we kind of discussing today. Now, what we will uh, sorry something popped up i just got a little confused uh, so fpis are regulated by two regulators in india one is the reserve bank of india and two is the securities exchange board of india securities exchange board of india is the capital market regulator in india and reserve bank is the banking regulator However, Reserve Bank as a banking regulator also performs the dual role of managing foreign exchange in India and regulating foreign exchange in India. And the regulations governing foreign portfolio investment comes under their role as the uh, manager for foreign exchange in India. SEBI regulations sets out how a investor, a foreign investor can be registered as a foreign portfolio investor. And only if you're registered, are you allowed to participate in investments in India as a FPI? The RBI regulations kind of broadly set out what are the limits within which you have to invest, what are the requirements vis-a-vis -vis each investment, what are the limits up to which FPI investments are available. So what technically happens is RBI will say, okay, I have, say, 50,000 crore limit for FPI investments into India. Any FPI who is registered with SEBI can bid for a particular amount of that. And kind of once they have the allocated limits, they are allowed to invest in India up to those limits, right? So that's how the FPI investment model broadly works. Apart from these two regulators, you also have tax laws, which are very relevant for FPIs that is codified under the Income Tax Act. And they're technically the uh, regulator is a tax department, which also will kind of just address what are the key tax requirements uh, during the course of this. Now, when you come to FPIs, you can get registered under two categories. There's a category one FPI, there's a category two FPI. While category one FPI and category two FPI does not change the nature of underlying investments that you can make, it, it does have a differentiation vis-a-vis the kind of uh, process you have to follow for an approval, your ability to issue what we call an offshore derivative instrument, right? So a CAT 1 FPI or a category 1 or CAT 1 as we call it, is generally a FPI who is a somewhat a regulated entity in an offshore jurisdiction. So it could be a bank, it could be an institution, uh, etc. all of that in a foreign jurisdiction. So that's broadly what CAT 1 is. CAT 2 is anyone who does not fall within the CAT 1. So CAT 1 also, apart from being a regulated entity, you have to be in the financial 
uh, FATF jurisdictions, you have to be IOS code compliant, etc. All of that are checked whether to see your CAT one. So between CAT one and CAT two, as I said, while end investments you can make a sale, there's difference in the uh, approval process, including your KYC norms, which are most important. So the ras rationale for the distinction is if you're a CAT one FPI, it's a light touch KYC process. If you're a CAT two AI uh, a, uh, FPI the uh, regulations on KYC are a lot more stringent in relation to getting your approval in place. So this is primarily your difference between a CAT1, CAT2. Now, once you are registered as an FPI, what are the kind of fixed income? I'm, I'm not talking about the equity part. I'll only talk about the debt part, what all kind of, I'm, I'm assuming that's more important for the fixed income category. So primarily what you have is you have corporate bonds, and corporate bonds can include things like, you know, securitized debt instrument, a plain vanilla non-convertible debenture, uh, et cetera. Then you have what we call the government bonds, which is essentially your, whether it's uh, P-bills, uh, GSECs, or even SDLs for that matter, which you're allowed to kind of participate in. And between... And these are the kind of uh, instruments you kind of uh, have the access to. Now, within these instruments, what we need to keep in mind is the government has kind of, uh, the regulator, which is RBI, has kind of set up different limits amongst these also, right? So there's what we call uh, the FAR, which is, you know, freely available uh, investments, uh, the, the freely accessible regime, et cetera, which is a set of government securities, which any FPI can invest in without looking at any limits. So there's an overall limit of total amount of FPI investments that can come in within, as long as you're within those limits. That means you've got allocable limits from the government, uh, from uh, RBI, you're allowed to kind of participate in that. Now, these are typically only GSECs, not short term at all. It'll all uh, normally in the range of five, 10 year, 15 year category instruments which you have no limits as to, like you, there's no requirement of having it for uh, holding only 50% of an investment, holding it for, you know, uh, how long you have to hold it for, et cetera. None of those kind of come in. So these, but these are categories of investments which are not, it's not one-time definition. RBI can notify it from time to time. They can increase the list. Uh, so I think the last notification came somewhere in the middle of last year to notify certain license, which all, so, so far, whatever has been notified are government securities. They've not notified anything else. Then you have what we call a VRR regime. A VRR regime is basically a voluntary retention regime. It's voluntary. A FBI can come and say that I want to purchase VRR limits of, say, 100 crore INR. What that means is that for once you get those limits, 100 crore has to be has to remain invested in India in those permitted uh, investments for a minimum period of three years. So in three years, they look at only 75 percentage, not the total 100. But at, the idea is for three years, you're invested in India. It does not mean that you have to be invested in a particular security. So a particular security can get redeemed. You can redeploy it into another investment. But the idea is those three years, you're invested in India. How a VRR limit helps is, it does not limit how you can invest in a particular security or how long you have to hold a particular security. The only restriction is for three years, the money should be in India, right? So that is the second regime. And the last is, okay, you don't fall under either of these two regimes, which is a general category, right? Now in the general category, what you need to keep in mind is the following restrictions. One is, there's a distinction between short-term instruments and long-term. Short-term is anything with tenure less than one year, and long-term is uh, more than one year as far as securities are concerned. So what they say is, if you're looking at government bonds, so depending on each class of bonds, whether it's GSEX, T-bills, or SDLs, your short-term in each of those categories should not be more than 30% of total investments. Similarly, when you take corporate bonds, your short-term, should not be more than 30% of total investments in corporate bonds. So this is one restriction you have on the general category. The second restriction you have on the general category comes on the corporate bond side, which is essentially you cannot take more than 50% of a total issue. So just for an example, say, uh, 
Renew is issuing NCDs on a private placement basis for INR 500 CR. You, as an FPI, you can you you together with your related entities can maximum pick up only INR 250 CR of that bond. So it's a restriction for each transaction. So you're not able to kind of invest 100%. So as a consequence, other than your FPI investors who kind of uh, are looking at it pure play from a returns perspective, they don't need to control a transaction, et cetera, all of that. We see a lot of, uh, we see those investors kind of participating in the general route. But if you're an FPI investor who wants to control the transaction, who wants to have final say, who wants to be the majority decision maker, et cetera, all of that, you might opt for a VRR route, right? So these are your limits vis-a-vis -vis how you kind of come into India. The other thing, obviously, from a regulatory perspective to keep in mind is there is what we have a designated uh, depository participant who you have to deal with, the DDP. So any FPI who wants to kind of invest in India chooses who they will partner with as their local agent, right? So these are all regulated entities who have a banking license and a custodian license in India. So RBI from time to time will designate some of them as DDPs. Any of the DDPs can be chosen by you as your local custodian. Now, once an FPI chooses a custodian, your bank accounts and your account where you hold your securities will be with that particular designated uh, depository participant. So the DDP, as we call it, right? So now you have a process to change. That is fine. But every time you change, you are... You, your, your, your kind of your bank accounts and your dematerialized accounts are held with that entity particularly. So if you say you choose a standard chartered bank, you'll have your bank account and your depository participant accounts with the standard chartered team. So standard chartered has a separate custodial license, separate banking license, and has a separate DDP uh, recognition, right? So that is what they will use. All your so any investment that you make in India will come into this bank account, which you've opened with a DDP. You'll bring in the funds from offshore, you put into this account. From here, you deploy it towards investments. And you can the custodian has to ensure that it is being deployed for a particular investment which is permitted under RBI regulation. So custodian, which is the DDP in this case, I, I'm sorry I'm using interchangeable terms, but custodian, DDP, etc., all of that is the same. Uh we essentially, the custodian performs a semi-compliance uh, role from a regulatory perspective, in as much as they just have to ensure that you're investing in what is permitted by our way. So that much check they will do. And so essentially, they if they have to be clear, they are the ones who will process your applications to buy FPI limits, or if you want a VRR limit, et cetera, all of that. So then they have to check that, okay, does this FPI has a VRR limit? Is this a VRR investment, non-VRR investment? Is it an FAR investment? So all of these things, the uh, custodian checks, very limited power and role, but they just have to broadly, they are the ones signing off finally that this is a RBI permitted or a SEBI permitted investment that you're doing, right? So that is broadly, I think, from a regulatory perspective, what you will see vis-a-vis -vis investments, the big issue, of course, uh, is taxation and what you're kind of uh, looking. So in a fixed income instrument, there are two cash flows that you're worried about uh, and to kind of understand taxation. One is the income you earn. Two is if you sell the instrument during the tenure, right? So one is uh, tax on income earned or tax on gains from sales. So it's either capital gains or a, a income tax uh, thing you're worried about. Till uh, recently, we had a regime where, at least for corporate bonds, you had a 5% withholding rate, which has been taken away. And income is now taxed at uh, the 20% rate for uh, income earned on uh, uh, any corporate bonds. So any interest income, any uh, yield, et cetera, all of that gets taxed at that 20% uh, uh, number. Uh, capital gains, long-term capital, long-term capital gains, and short-term capital gains, of course, differ. For bonds, uh, one year and above is considered long-term. Uh, short-term is everything below that, and the rates are different. Obviously, depending on how the double taxation avoidance agreements are worded between the jurisdiction where the FPI is incorporated in India, 
uh, you can obviously get even more concessional rates, etc. Uh, the DTAs have constantly been evolving. And in fact, on the tax front, one of the key things that uh, India is looking at is a situation where they feel that double taxation avoidance benefit is being given on the basis of domicile of the FPI, whereas they need to probably also look at where the underlying investors in the FPI are located so that you know the shopping for tax-friendly jurisdictions to incorporate an FPI is um, kind of uh, handled a little bit better. They feel that, you know, I mean, if we are giving the benefit to the residents of a particular country through the FPI route, it should not be that the residents of some other country is getting that benefit. So there is a talk around kind of uh, uh, seeing how to kind of plug that gap. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the DTAs are constantly evolving. I think over the last five to 10 years, our DTAs with uh, Europe has gotten a lot friendlier. Uh, we've got a lot more FPI investments coming from, you know, some of the European uh, jurisdictions and that constantly evolving. I think, I mean, India over the last uh, five to 10 years has our relationships uh, across governments has also resulted in some uh, really uh, uh, the improvement in some of the DTA clauses, et cetera, for residents of, of, of the friendly nations. And uh, definitely that's something that constantly keeps evolving. Uh, uh, Maxim, uh, I, I think I've covered quite a bit. I know uh, you had said 10 minutes. Uh, is, is it fine? Shall I conclude? Or I would not. Uh, I, I, I cannot um, reject myself uh, in uh, <laughs> my will to hold you a little bit longer as you will leave soon. So uh, let me ask you two questions just um, because I think... Oh, no, no, uh, Maxim, be... I'm happy to I'm happy to stick around for another 15, 20 minutes. So don't worry. If you want, to, we can f have uh, Venkat also finish and I can stick around for some questions. That's okay. Uh, I think I will ask uh, one question just uh, in continuation of uh, what you were speaking. What is the um, direction of change in the regulatory regime? So is can we say that it is becoming more liberal? What is going on with investment limits? Uh, what is the approach of uh, regulators, RBI and uh, exchange uh, uh, market commission say, uh, to this issue? So definitely there is an approach and there's a thought process that we should, this, I mean, this is our time to attract foreign money, right? I mean, we are on the cusp of a period where I think uh, India, if not the best, is one of the most preferred jurisdictions for investments. So to tap into that potential, we definitely, I think there is a thought process to have it as relaxed as possible to get it. At the same time, there is a balance of payments crisis we don't want to get into it's at all of that. So short-term investments are definitely going to be regulated more. When I say short-term, anything less than one year. In fact, they will try and kind of, uh, in fact, the initial uh, FPI regime change when it happened in 2019, I don't know whether it was oversight or intentional, there was almost no ability. They treated less than three years as short-term investments, right? And then, you know, there was a subsequent amendment in 2020, which kind of clarified, okay, fine. I mean, we are taking the three-year benchmark to one year, and that is how we'll kind of treat. Right. So, but in the regulator's mind, they don't want money kind of flying out on a really, really short-term basis. They'd like to lock in money for a longer time, but they want uh, to relax the thing. So I think you would see a lot more the direction will be as long as we're talking about VRR limit based investments or investments in government securities, which are five years and above, you'd see as much change as you need to ensure those investments coming. But the short term, I think, will continue to be regulated, in fact, made tighter if possible, so that the money we attract is more the kind of one which uh, stays in India for a longer duration and kind of helps build the debt market here also, uh, which I think is most important. So if, in fact, so some of the things, some of the key changes that they did uh, suggest this. So they 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 say short-term money also, they 
kind of make a distinction so if you look at some of the amendments they made there these security receipts which asset reconstruction companies issue okay these are typical debt instruments but backed by non performing loans so discounted loans so i bought uh, i mean uh, 20 cents to the dollar i bought some asset i issued some security receipts and that also an fpi can invest in they realize that those asset cash flows will never be have a longer tenure right it can redeem immediately so they have kind of exempted those from the one year category and the limitations of 30% etc all of that so they definitely there's a there's a focus and there's an understanding that this is the time when investment is going to come and we should build on that but purely speculative or short term money is something that they don't want except in asset classes which only has short term kind of tasers so so in your security receipts etc you will see those kind of relaxations coming in you're hoping they do that even for certain kinds of microfinance loans which or microfinance entities etc all of that who are raising debt but those are things that we i think as things progress uh, we will kind of see but the direction is positive and that that's that's what we think will happen thank you it's actually fascinating how you have managed to cover such a broad list of topics in quite a detailed way in such a short time span thank you again nikas i think uh, it is uh, clear for our participants now that such a legal uh environment such a complex legal environment as in india requires qualified guidance uh, which is which becomes truly indis- indispensable to orient yourself uh, in this market and now i think it is high time to dive deeper in the practical features of the indian fixed income market so uh you know before coming to the uh, corporate bond market on fixed income side of course uh, both uh, Vivek Kumar and uh, Nihat Bashir have covered most of things, but I'll quickly go through the influences for FTI participation. Uh, as far as the current scenario of India is concerned, so we have a macroeconomic stability where we are a stable inflation. Inflation is uh, coming down slowly, and uh, however, RBI is very clear and they have an Arjuna eye of bringing down inflation to four uh, percent consistently on a durable basis, and. Uh, Uh, on the if you are going to talk about this uh, uh uh you know uh uh on the other side on the rbi governor has also said that the inflation uh, is going to slightly pick up uh, in the last uh, you know uh, the f- end of the fiscal year on that basis uh, we need to see whether we are able to achieve the 4% inflation on a durable basis thereby we need to see how far we are going to have the rate that uh, scenario is going to start so market believes that the rate cut will start from august 24 however considering the volatility and the fed markets uh, and us treasury yields is again gone up uh, you know the uh, us uh, inflation is also shooting up so we are in a, a state of confusion and also suddenly now because of the iran israel uh, you know escalation is going on and uh, accordingly we expect the crude oil prices to shoot 100 rupees thereby we can expect the inflation to go further if it happens so on that basis you know we cannot immediately assess whether we'll start the rate cut scenario uh, you know uh, starting uh, august so that's the only thing so as a, but other than that we can say that we have a stable inflation i think vivek has covered it mostly and we have a prudent fiscal policies also we have brought down the total borrowings for the year and uh, also we are able to cover many things for the fpis uh, you know uh, we are uh, able to cover th- the first six months of borrowing in such a way uh, that uh, uh, it can match the fpi recommends also for example we never been there for the last uh, two years when the green bond issuance has started for sovereign green bond issuance has started uh, we always used to issue green bonds uh, uh in some time in uh, you know november and december kind of a months actually but uh, the government has announced uh, based on the jp morgan uh, bond index fund induction to start from june so they are also you know decided to issue 10 year green bond sovereign green bond uh, the first six months itself so accordingly government is also planning its uh, policies uh, to woo the uh, you know uh, fpi participation and also uh you know uh, uh the foreign exchange reserves is robust currently and uh, hopefully it supports the stability of the rupee 
of course the view changes you know some people are talking about will come down below 83 and some people are talking about is go up will touch around 84 uh, but hopefully i think uh, with a strong foreign exchange reserve what we have and whatever money we are going to get from fta participation we should be able to support the stability of the rupee so as far as the economic growth is concerned india of the foremost country uh, you know having a sustainable economic growth uh, post uh, covid and uh, you know it's definitely attracting foreign investment is very very critical on this point basically many uh, entities uh, lower traded entities also which are planning for a bond issue there you know uh, we can strongly hope that the kind of economic growth for example if you take about bfsi sector uh, thereby almost 70 to 75% of the bfsi sector are getting a rating credit rating upgrade so at least for the next 3 years uh, you know uh, we can be expecting very uh, minimal percentage of a default so on that basis is uh, you know definitely the economic growth is going to help all the issuer entity uh, to get a credit rating upgrade as well as uh, able to tap the bond market i will come to the question uh, you know uh, why they want to tap the bond market more uh, you know uh, now the rbi regulations have come in on nbfc especially uh basically you know uh, they they increase the risk weightage on banks on nbfcs and unsecured loans and credit card loans thereby uh, you know pushing the uh, these entities uh, to tap the other alternative investment uh, or alternative fund raising sources so uh, accordingly we do expect uh, uh, these people will tap the bond market more in the coming years and the point to note that the last fiscal ending march 31 2024 was the highest ever a uh, bond issue and this happened in india has crossed 10 trillion in rupees uh, so uh, monetary policy as i told you that is effective and you know they're managing inflation and exchange rate fluctuation is increases the investor confidence so we expect fpi more and more already post announcement of uh, this jp morgan bond index fund and the bloomberg index fund uh, uh, we have a record number of fti investments uh, uh, in fact uh, the uh, figure has touched uh, uh you know uh, the, uh, high, as an all time high i could say all time high it is after 2014 15 after 10 years uh, we are almost reached more than 1 lakh crore uh you know the only problem we are currently facing is external sector dynamics uh, uh you know uh, managing external debt uh, you know uh, reduces the vulnerability to current fluctuation but the concerns are the global economic conditions like fed or other uh, you know inflationary conditions and geopolitical tensions and of course uh, thereby uh the commodity price fluctuations uh, next page mark maxen once again yeah. so this i think uh, i think more or less uh, and he has has covered it i don't have to talk about it because because he's talked it much in detail so you can shift to the next page yeah so the current scenario market scenario when we talk about it you know uh, the global inflation and the uh, interest rate uh, uh, it's again started affecting the us fed rates and uh, Uh, thereby uh, because of the us inflation is unstable currently we are having 10 year uh, uh, us is currently trading around 4.65 uh, uh, thereby you know india is currently trading closed at 7.19 uh, so it is definitely even though uh, indian india's rbi governor says that uh, we don't strictly fo- don't follow the external shocks and uh, uh, you know us fed the treasury movements but still you know uh, somehow the, the you know we have to follow the traders are following the uh, us yield movements as such so thereby in the last 15 days the gsec 10 year gsec has moved yield has moved up by uh, almost uh, i would say 15 basis points so uh, th- that's why i initially I talked about it because of the inflation is being unstable and india's uh, inflation was also expected to go up uh, in the last 6 months of the fiscal uh, we don't know whether we are able to Uh, sustain the 4% uh, inflation target on a durable basis uh, so us treasury yields as i told you the fluctuations are affecting indian bonds too indian in- bond yields also has gone up by 15 per- 15 basis points and as i told you that uh, we expect the delay in revert rate reciprocal even though the market is talking about august 24 but uh, uh, if we need to have a 4% sustainable uh, uh, you know uh, inflationary figures uh, and plus uh, you know Uh, and more stable cut rate cut starts from us treasury uh, you know uh, we don't expect uh, the repo rate reversal to start immediately starting august so we can expect further delay on that basis also this is my personal opinion so uh, 
uh, and also you know uh, the tightened liquidity uh, banking system liquidity till march uh, kept the bond yields under check so the yield was not uh, uh, coming down drastically but however uh, on the government bond side the uh, uh, the market is expanding and the investor appetite is also expanding we have large investors like epfo employees provident fund organization and pension funds and large insurance firm like life insurance corporation etc uh, and plus the uh, you know uh, expectation of uh, expectation of uh, uh, jp morgan inflow jp morgan uh, bond index fund uh, as coming in lot of investors uh, or foreign banks has started uh, Uh, buying those bonds heavily in the last 6 uh, 7 months uh, thereby uh, for example i can tell you the march 15 to march 30th uh, the state development loans issued by the states uh, through rbi uh, they never used to issue more than 30000 to 40000 crores in a single tranche but the last 12 days of uh, the end of march they are able to borrow more than 1 lakh 20000 crores i'm talking about in rupees terms uh, and it has been you know fully uh invested by these invested uh, without any major deviation in yields that is a surprising thing so this clearly showed that you know the investor appetite is increasing investor confidence is in- increasing uh and uh, you know uh, uh, there was never expected actually so market is surprised totally uh, the entire amount has got absorbed by the uh, investors without uh, any major change in yields uh so of course you know uh vivek has talked about crude oil prices the conflict between I- iran and israel and uh, you know uh, rbi policy status quo and our focus on inflation continues so we need to get uh, uh, they need to be keeping an arjuna eye on inflation to keep at 4% on durable basis that we need to check yeah next page yeah please so fpa partisan as i told you earlier fpa net investments has touched you know 1 lakh uh, 21059 crores uh, year ending march 23 24 highest after 2014 15 as per the nsdl data so is mostly because of uh, the announcement of jp morgan and blom boom block bond index fund attracts fia investors and surge in investment major market traders banks foreign banks domestic indian commercial banks uh, primary dealers uh, and everybody has started accumulating uh, bonds uh, 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 due to this uh, india's inclusion announcement by jp morgan and bloomberg so uh, the fpa participation is coming in mainly uh, because of as i told you you know a stable economy compared to other uh, emerging economies or other uh, you know major economies also uh, we have consistently showing economic growth and we have uh, continuously lowering inflation we are in, trying to achieve our 4% target without any much fluctuations and that too we have a stable investment returns of course you know we need to talk about currency fluctuations etc but more or less we need we have a stable investment return uh, as such if we see that uh, without any rate cut the 10 year gsec once upon a time was touched almost 7.80 then it was majorly trading less than 7.60 without any rate cut is come down to 6.90 and because of the further us uh, treasury fluctuations is come up till 7.20 levels so uh, you know we need to see how much the rates will come down uh post uh, you know uh, rbi announcement of change in stance are you know the rates uh, the rate cut started we need to see where we can expect the gsec to come down my expectation is that uh, it will start between uh, you know uh, 675 to 7% range to start with maybe uh, if they start the rate cuts by august and by end of the year as vivek said that it may go down to 6.5 uh, of course you know we do expect that the political stability to be there Uh, uh thereby you know it will give more comfort to fta participation so that you know government will keep up the promise of uh, you know uh, keeping the figures stable at the fiscal deficit whatever been announced in the february budget yeah next page please max so this i just like you know quickly go through because you know we have fta debt replacement status as on april 15 uh, the foreign investment limits in corporate bonds we have only 17% has been utilized so there are a lot of limits available as far as foreign corporate bonds is concerned and also next page uh, also on the government bond side uh, you know we have only approximately 25% of the general under, under general uh, eligible investor for investor side uh, we have only 24 to 25% of the uh, limits has been utilized so we have a lot of limits uh, available for fpi and thereby we do expect uh, you know uh, will be easily to absorb uh, the uh, inflows coming uh, from uh, 
JP Morgan bond index fund and Bloomberg bond index fund. And even if it cross, definitely as um, Bashir has pointed out that government is always willing to, uh, you know, change the uh, limits as and when is required. So on that basis, uh, you know, there's absolutely no issues on that. Yeah, next page, Maxim. So what are the opportunities in corporate bond market? So, you know, uh, diversification, you know, uh, beyond equities and government bonds, uh, you know, uh, people are always coming into corporate bond because if you have a diversified credit rating shorting from uh, AAA to uh, almost uh, triple B or below because we did triple B minus is the investable grade, but, uh, you know, it can go down further. So uh, uh, once again, uh, uh, and economic factors, if you see that, uh, you know, uh, exposure to different set of economic factors and market dynamics compared to the home market. So definitely people will try and diversify their investments uh, on an emerging economy, especially in Asia. I think India is only the one country which has been uh, on the, uh, showing very good economic growth and people want to diversify the investments more in uh, Indian markets. And uh, uh, high yield potential, uh, corporate bond yields definitely offers uh, attractive yields compared to developed markets and also uh, co compared to the government bond yields of Indian markets. And uh, of course, the rates can vary from, uh, you know, uh, somewhere between 7% to uh, 20%. This kind of, uh, you know, yield they can get uh, uh, based on the risk reward they want to use. So basically, if they want to make a AAA kind of a paper or if it's for the government bond, they'll get around 7, 720 and for a, a 10 year or a three year, uh, you know, triple A uh, government uh, PSU, kind of a public sector undertaking bond, they'll be getting around 760 kind of a level. And if you go by slowly by double A and uh, A and triple B categories, the levels automatically increases. So it's based on the risk reward. So that's why I said that the credit spread, varying credit qualities, higher returns on higher credit risk and maturity profiles. The range of maturities that allows investors uh, sorting from three months to you know, 40, 50 years also, they can invest in GSEX also, uh, you know, uh, the range of maturity allows investors to match their investment horizon and liquidity preferences. And uh, sector exposure, uh, specific sector growth opportunities are available in India across opportunities, whether you want to get into BFSI or you want to get into infra, there is a lot of opportunities available in India to get into uh, sector exposure. And uh, investor delays, as I said already, that, you know, there are a lot of FPI interest coming in AAA rated bonds and quasi sovereign bonds, common guaranteed bonds, uh, uh, you know, uh, and also people prefer to have a liquid securities to trade uh, uh, based on the interest rate sensitivity. So uh, in common guaranteed bonds also, you know, we have two types of bond. Uh, one is, uh, is fully, uh, you know, guaranteed by the government. Uh, uh, the other is, uh, you know, with the government comfort. And one more bond also is available is that the government assures uh, you know, it's, kind of, it's not a guarantee, but, uh, you know, they uh, uh, pay on behalf of the issuers, the entity, government entity borrows money on behalf of the government uh, so that uh, uh, the government pays the interest and principal two days in advance. So there's a three type of bonds also in government bonds, guaranteed bonds are available. So, you know, preferably in case any investors would like to go for a triple A, domestic to triple A rated bonds. And uh, there are a lot of options available starting from triple A to uh, you know, triple B levels. The yeah, next page, Maxon. So uh, factors to consider before investments, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, definitely uh, risk reward, I told you very clearly. So people have to look at the credit quality of the paper. And of course, the about the promoters, they have to look into it. The corporate governance, they have to look into it. And uh, coming to next point is interest rate risk. So long-term bonds to have a higher interest rate risk than short-term bonds. So depends upon their, uh, you know, investment criteria and uh, limits. They need to uh, deploy funds whether they want to invest in short-term bonds or long-term bonds uh, because interest rate fluctuation will be too much in case if you want to get into the long-term bonds. So liquidity, definitely corporate bond, liquid, Indian corporate bonds are slightly illiquid. Uh, so in case if you're getting into AAA kind of a bond, definitely it enables ease of trading and uh, there could be a, a temporary active secondary market till the bonds are sold out. Uh, the yield curve, depending upon the investment objectives, I stated already, opt for bonds with different maturities along with the yield curve. And, uh, uh, you know, if you want to take care of the inflation risk, even though India is definitely one of the better countries are controlling inflation, but still if any FPI investors are worried about it, they can look at inflation-linked bonds and floating rate bonds. But unfortunately, in India, this product is not taking off very well, but these options are also available. 
tax implications i think already uh, you know uh, uh, bashir has already informed of the tax implications uh, regulatory environment also bashir has talked about it we have to stay informed about regulatory changes and policies uh, uh, impacting uh, bond market so we have three regulators one is rbi reserve bank of india and uh, you know uh, other is sebi security exchange board of india and the latest one is uh, ifsca this is gift city uh, regulator we talk about uh, international financial services uh, center authority uh, so uh, government is pushing uh, all the uh, external uh, offshore bond issuances to go through ifsca uh, so issue specific factors were coming into it uh, you know as i already said we need to check out the financial health of the issuer industry dynamics uh, you know uh, market reputation of the bond issuer corporate governance industry outlook and regulatory compliances etc so this is very very critical for any issuer any fpi uh to invest in india these are the main factors they are getting into so they need to have a proper analysis on those things uh investment horizon and goals i think uh, you know as i already talked about uh, what kind of a tenor what kind of a credit rating what kind of a yield you are going to achieve select those bonds based on your goals yeah next page uh so economic growth i already talked about it robust economic growth trajectory makes indian corporate bond markets much more attractive destination for investment regulatory environment has become uh, india has become very investor friendly over the years uh, we have enhanced tra transparency for even for a you know primary market bidding we have electronic bidding platform uh, you know and we have improving market infrastructure and uh, simplified investment processes have been boosted investor confidence and lot of uh, that's why since for the past 6 months we are respectively getting lot of investment uh, from fpis uh, you know corporate as i said corporate bonds are non convertible debentures across credit rating uh you get the yield depends upon the risk reward high yield bonds you know uh, is a lower credit at below triple e category or you can say triple b category boosted by uh, structured debt products uh, for example we can talk about uh, goswami infratech uh, it's almost given a yield of 18.75 with the uh, comfort of uh, tata sons uh, uh, you know uh, uh, equity shares uh, as a pledge so a lot of people have bought it and it's got a very good uh, demand in the market as such so those kind of options also available in case if you want to get into high yield definitely uh, it is all depend upon how you want to structure the debt instruments and anybody who wants to get into money market instruments either in gsec common bond we have treasury bills and in corporate bonds we have commercial papers but these are all uh, commercial paper is unsecured uh, debt structured debt products i said that you know you can get a higher return for the same kind of a credit rating with mitigation structures but you need to be more careful, careful on the due diligence uh securitized debt instrument is also possible on abs and mbs uh, uh you know uh, but this all things has per the regulatory compliances yeah next page you have done even more than i expected because you get got us back to macro then uh, walked us through the universe of bonds both government and uh, corporate thank you a lot and uh, now as we are better equipped uh, to understand the realities of the indian fixed income market i will take a brief uh, chance uh, to um introduce uh, you to the sibons uh, platform as a tool for those willing to invest in india as uh, for the highlights of our coverage of the indian market we can say that we have full coverage of government and municipal securities as deals and um, more than um, 23000 outstanding inr corporate bonds of very different rating categories of very different issuer uh, backgrounds we have more than 9000 issuers in our database and uh, to help you find out the specific bond uh, fitting in your investment strategy fitting in your investment ideas we have a powerful bond screener where can you uh, you can search uh, a bond by rank rating segment yield industry and 50 more other parameters we have uh, multiple quote uh, sources updated uh, on a daily basis coming from stock exchanges coming from market participants finda and other so sources we have rating information both from international uh, largest uh, rating agencies and uh, all indian rating agencies and our overall idea and uh, the source of our value added in is in structuring uh, 
the disaggregated data, data which is uh, found in a fragmented way in different sources, we put it together, we analyze it, we refine it, and uh, make it easily accessible in one window. So in our website, you can check emission documents, you can uh, take a look at uh, cash flows and export uh, that to Excel. You can see trade volumes, you can uh, track price change and yield change uh, from um, based on the quotes from different uh, sources and providers. Uh, also, you can track corporate actions, uh, such as defaults, uh, auctions and additional placements, uh, call, put options, early redemption terms. Also, we have advanced bond calculator to help uh, investors uh, calculate uh, some advanced uh, parameters of uh, bond, different metrics to assess the quality and parameters of investment. And all of this, of course, is exportable to Excel. And additionally to those actively using Excel, we have a special add-in, which uh, let uh, you to export data directly from our database to your Excel spreadsheet, indices, bond prices, and many more. Uh, also, we have uh, yield curves, uh, sovereign yield curve, uh, yield curves of different issuers, uh, in the corporate segment, uh, and uh, this uh, helps you to find some outliers to be maybe used as your investment ideas. We um, track uh, multiple market indices, uh, for example, aggregate bond market statistics uh, on quantity and volumes of new issuances in uh, uh, local currency and international currency bonds. Um, some macro indices and some indices which serve as base rates for floating rate nodes. Thank you. It was just a brief presentation, but whenever you need some further details, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Feel free to reach out uh, to our team. We will be delighted to answer your questions. And saying that, I think we are ready to uh, come to our final part. Um, I uh, request the audience uh, to put your questions in questions and answers box so that I could uh, read these questions out to our audience. Uh, so um, as for the copies of the materials, uh, whether they will be mailed or not, uh, I think we will uh, talk, uh, I will talk to the speakers and uh, if they give their consent, we will certainly mail them to uh, those registered for the webinar. And uh, while we are still waiting for other questions, uh, let me ask uh, Venkat just uh, a brief question. Mm, the Indian fixed income market is really renowned for the domination of uh, highest rating, uh, rating segments, triple A bonds and everything uh, below double uh, A plus used uh, to be considered as unreliable investments. Has it changed? Does it worth it, in your opinion, to go beyond uh, AA plus? So what lies beneath this rating segment? See, uh, it's a good question, actually. Uh, uh, definitely 75% to 80% of the uh, total primary issuances happens uh, on a triple A and double A plus only. In fact, only triple A, to be very frank with you. So definitely that much the market, uh, you know, has to deepen further. Uh, uh, but uh, definitely it is not a concern for worry as such. You know, the only reason for that is that uh, uh, till last year, the bank loans uh, was much, much uh, cheaper. Bank loan rates were much, much cheaper for the lower trade rated segments as such. Because uh, if once you go down below double A, if it comes to double A minus and below, then definitely uh, the bond rates, uh, the investor segment uh, was uh, somewhat squeezed uh, in bond market vis-a-vis -vis compared to the term loan market. Uh, but the, as I told you, the for initial talk, uh, you know, the market is expanding rapidly and uh, uh, there is a, a huge segment of, uh, H, you know, HNIs and, uh, you know, uh, wealth managers are you know, largely tapping those uh, wealth clients uh, on HNIs. Uh, this market is also picking up slowly and uh, in fact it is uh, picking up very fast uh, in this year onwards 
the reason why is that uh, last year the government has announced uh, you know tax amendments on uh, mlds uh, uh, market linked debentures as well as on debt mutual funds so on that basis a lot of people have you know would like to get for a higher yield uh, prefer to get a, achieve a higher yields thereby they started investing directly into lower credit rated bonds uh, where they give attractive yields for example indian uh, top notch banks offer an fd rates of around 7% plus um, you know uh, but in in case of able to achieve uh, around 10 to 12% on a decent credit rated bonds people definitely prefer to tap those kind of a bonds directly because uh, after one year of the bond uh, you get a long term capital gains of course the interest are as per the uh, you know uh, uh, tax uh, slabs of the respective investors uh thereby if you see uh, currently uh, you know uh, we have lot of uh, alternative investment funds are tapping lower credited bonds tapping higher yields lot of wealth funds are tapping and uh, you know uh, we have online bond portals have started uh, mushrooming actually almost a huge number of bond portals have started uh, tapping these segments uh, of course in small call term but this um, this online bond, bond portals are mushrooming in india so they are also started tapping the investors retail investors they are also getting into triple b a kind of a categories and followed by you know a uh, lot of banks uh, large uh, large banks are getting into uh, you know uh, a or a plus kind of a segment uh, they started investing uh, for the past 3 4 months and uh, followed by uh, you know uh, debt mutual funds in fact they also because uh, that's why i said the regulators have done a fantastic job for debt mutual funds also they have started uh, the uh, sebi has started the emergency fund which is guaranteed by the government of india uh, you know uh, uh, wherein they provide any kind of emergency that may happen for franklin templeton uh, they are willing to buy those bonds on emergency cases so on that basis debt mutual funds also started looking back uh, the credit funds are you know a category or a plus category so there is a vast segment of investors uh, I uh, started looking into these papers plus of course the fpi market as i told you that uh, this uh, goswami infratech deal many fpis have invested in those bonds so you know uh, definitely yes i have i, I have to agree that as of today the aaa and aa plus segment dominates the indian market but nevertheless you know the lower credited bonds also is catching up very fast okay and not to worry uh, because of the credit quality because i already told you that most of the things because the bank term loans have been offering a better deal compared to usually compared to bonds for a lower credited bonds that's the reason uh, you know the market was not picking up now because of the regulations is coming up especially on for example i told you about uh, uh, risk weightage increase on uh, you know on bonds to lending to nbfcs thereby they are pushing this by people to come to the capital market so definitely those things are going to help this market to improve thank you it's very clear and i think actually uh, we uh, got a question from the audience uh, what are the indian market uh, perspectives in the issue of working with foreign investors are there any actions in doing the market more open to foreign investors and here uh, i would uh, like to turn to vivek again vivek do you uh, given this uh, how current account balance is uh, trends are changing given uh, the line currently taken by rbi do you see any significant change coming in terms of liberalization of treatment uh, towards uh, foreign investors uh well thanks maxim I, i i think we've had a round of discussion on the regulatory backdrop as such so i'll probably take you a little bit back in 2013 when uh, we had a terrible experience as far as our external accounts were concerned and um, the overall growth scenario on the inflation backdrop was not really conducive you know we were growing at about 5 5 and 1/2 6% inflation was close to 10% and the current account deficit was uh, running around 4 and 1/2 percent points of gdp but these are uh, Uh, out of the chart numbers that i'm talking about these are not regular numbers and this culminated into the uh, unfortunately coincided paper tantrum episode by the us federal reserve and the ramifications of this perfect storm uh, 
culminated into almost a 23% depreciation in rupee in a span of two months. So we are coming off from that background. India had to do a lot of out of box thinking. Uh, we, uh, as a as a country, we experimented with let's say keeping out the dollar buyers from the market. We asked oil companies to not bid for dollars in the spot market. That demand was completely met by uh, one of the state-owned banks in India. So basically, RBI was was meeting that demand to one dedicated state-owned bank. And they were trying to control the foreign exchange market and the pressures during that time. And they had to tap its diaspora. Uh, once again, uh, there was uh, the, the NRI deposits that uh, uh, were attracted, that, that the mechanism was designed, and we saw almost $30, $35 billion of inflow in a span of three months towards the end of 2013. So that kind of stabilized the rupee. Now, the moot point why I'm trying to bring this up is. Uh, to, to appreciate the fact that the regulators had a tough time dealing with that scenario. And we would not want to go back to the 2013 experience once again. We would not want to experience that from a regulatory standpoint. So uh, the regulators have uh, taken a series of steps. Uh, I do note that uh, Nehas and Bot Venkat, they've talked about uh, how investments are not now really encouraged at the short end of the uh, yield curve. So basically, we are now more welcoming at the longer end of the yield curve than at the shorter end of the yield curve. Now, as far as the liberalization is concerned, I guess, we'll probably take uh, one step at a time, and those steps will be extremely thought through. And they would appear that RBI or the regulators are extremely slow. But uh, I guess the learnings that we've had in 2013 will probably uh, keep us guarded for times to come. And we would be more welcoming of flows which are more durable. So that is probably the reason why you see a different shade of regulation for FDI and a different shade of regulation for FPI investment. And within FPI, there's a different shade of regulation for the equity class investors and there's a different shade of uh, regulation for the debt investor. So it, it's all about what the regulators consider as more durable, what the regulators consider as more growth enhancing from a longer term perspective. And they would obviously not want uh, uh, speculators to, to come and come in the market and try and punt on Indian assets. So to that extent, I guess the the overall approach will be extremely gradual and extremely thought through. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, I just think that it was uh, really nice that we came back to this questions, a question again from the macro perspective, which you, of course, bring to our uh, in our discussion. We actually have uh, some more questions, uh, and uh, some of them are specifically addressed uh, to Bashir. Uh, but oh, Nihaz Bashir, I mean, um, but he's not there, unfortunately, not with us anymore. And we have to wrap it up. Uh, but I'm sure that the speakers will be happy to address uh, the questions, the residual questions uh, in uh, uh, private uh, correspondence in LinkedIn. Uh, so I feel free, I guess, to uh, reach out uh, to them. And uh, I would stress again that it was uh, my pleasure to host this wonderful webinar with uh, wonderful speakers, uh, Vivek uh, Venkat uh, and of course Nihas, thank you a lot for taking time. Thank you for joining us.